Well, welcome Shona Brownlee to the Forces Sport podcast. Thank you so much. I feel like I've been chasing you for months. <laughs> stalking. Whether you, stalking, whether you wanted that or not. But um, you're such a prized possession to us. Your story is incredible. And, you know, we want to sort of use the next half an hour to sort of talk about where you've come from, how important music is, and obviously now how important skiing's become in your life. Why but, you just um, put salt on your porridge? Yeah, <laughs> very crucial questions like that, which that's the sort of areas that Jules will cover. Um, but first of all, why don't you tell us where, like, why you decided to join the RAF and sort of the, the music side of you, was that before you joined up? You, do you join up for that? Just tell us, like, your, your becoming into the RAF and, and how that came about. Yeah, I joined up specifically to be a musician. That's been my background ever since school. I finished school, did a degree and then a master's in music performance. And then I was freelancing for a few years. I did some uh, teaching, some playing in shows, uh, just anything that paid the bills really. And then I saw a job advertising the RAF. I had a couple of friends who were in the RAF bands. Uh, and I'd always thought that the military thing wasn't really for me, but I came down and visited them and got the chance to sit in on the band rehearsals and realised that actually it's exactly the same thing as I'm doing in Civvy Street, but I'm just wearing a uniform instead. So, yeah, I decided to, to go for it and joined up. And it's the French horn that you play. Yeah. Um, was, um, was again, was that, why did you pick the French horn? Again, I didn't pick the French horn. I knew I wanted <laughs> to go and study music and my school had a spare French horn oh, sitting in the cupboard so my music teacher said here you go have this one. Because it's not the easiest one to play is it? In terms uh, of brass instruments it's, it's got a lot of solos and stuff like that so there's a lot that's quite complicated. Uh, it depends, there can be a lot of solos but we play in a section of normally four or five um, and some people like doing the solo parts. I don't like doing the solo <laughs> parts quite so much. I'm quite happy to sit further down the section but yeah, I really like it. I'm glad that it's my instrument. All this became before you'd even discovered sport, which we shall get on to in a little while. But I'm guessing that you were putting in the same amount of preparation and rehearsal with your music as somebody would on it with an athletics or sporting background. Yeah, it's, it's very similar, I think, in terms of time commitments. I mean, your evenings and weekends are taken up with your own personal practice as well as orchestra rehearsals, then concerts and... There's, there's a lot of time involved. Oh, well, and of course, when you did eventually join the RAF, that is when things really turned a corner for you in, in some unusual ways. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was a little bit unexpected joining up, specifically expecting to be a musician. And then I actually got, <laughs> I got injured during basic training, so I didn't even manage to finish phase one training before, before my injury happened. Um, and just tell yeah. us a little bit more about the injury, how, how, you know, as much as you're comfortable about talking, how it happened um, and, you know, how we've got to where we are today. Uh, we were out on our final exercise. I was right at the end of training uh, and it was a fairly innocuous accident. I slid off a ledge um, and at the time we just thought, oh, it's a sprained ankle, you know, have a little bit of physio on it, it'll, it'll get better. Um, and then unfortunately just developed some complications, didn't really heal the way I hoped it would or it was expected to and then spent the next few years having various rounds of surgery. Um, I was very fortunate in the military I had access to the rehabilitation facilities at Headley Court mm. uh, so it was top-notch rehab um, but yeah unfortunately things just didn't work the and way I was hoping. Did you have to make the decision to have it amputated? Was that because I, I'm wondering um, in Civvy Street whether that's a different decision but, but because you've got the backing of the military and then it's more familiar to them possibly that people have amputations or the rest of it but in the end was that a decision you had to make? It was a decision that I made yes nobody sort of I was the one who brought it up to the medical professionals it wasn't forced on me or nobody was saying you must have this mm -hmm. done but I'd spent six years hopping about on crutches my leg was effectively useless I couldn't walk on it we couldn't wait bear um and I was told we're at the end of the treatment route, there's no more surgery we can do to fix it. Rehab obviously hasn't had the effect we wanted. And at that stage, I decided that actually I would probably be better off without it. And you so. said, as you said, it, a fairly innocuous kind of injury initially. Just, does it still blow your mind a little bit that it's come, it's come to this? Just Not that, you know, life's bad because of it, but just because, you know, it's, it's life changing. Yeah, I mean, it's also, almost the opposite you say not life's bad because of it and it's not at all and actually it's opened up 
a whole new, I'd never have got involved in any of the sport or half the things that I've done if it hadn't been for the injury. So I can't say it's a bad thing. It's definitely not what I expected when I joined the RAF. But yeah, definitely I, I don't say it's a bad thing. So post-injury, you were rehabbing at Headley Court and there's a huge emphasis there on perhaps giving sport a try. Yeah. And is that where the sporting bug happened for you? That's exactly where it happened, yeah. They've got fantastic facilities uh, and fantastic access to a lot of different adaptive sport programmes. Uh, and I was fortunate to be offered the opportunity to go on a battle back exped. Uh, battle backs, they provide sport and adventurous training opportunities to wounded, injured and sick personnel. Uh, and I was offered the chance to go for 10 days and learn to ski in Bavaria. So I'd never skied before. and. It was just a good chance to do something a little bit different from slogging away the rehab in the gym. Well, I imagine when you were rehabbing, the Headley Court band was something that everybody <laughs> wanted to be part of. I mean, were, were you the most popular person there? Did you say, come on, guys? <laughs> Not at all. Oh. <laughs> Actually, it wasn't a band there. <laughs> but, but, but were you still able to play your music whilst you I did. There? While yeah. I was there, I did take my French horn with me and then in the evenings. It was just... Quick, it's a nice little, little, bit, little bit of normality <laughs> yeah, between yeah, the yeah. Just, oh, This is what I do, this is something that I know and when things aren't going so well in the gym, I can do this. And, and has music always been there for you to fall back on when, when life has thrown up its hiccups? Uh, music's just, it's pretty much just been my, my life. I mean, I started piano lessons when I was seven and since then, in some shape or form, there's always been some kind of music. So yeah, that's, I suppose, been the constant. And even with the sport now being such a mainstay, does the music become because you, you you know you've chosen for example to be here at Northolt you know you're you're on an elite athlete scheme with the Royal Air Force, you're choosing now to come back and join you know work with the band and stuff like that. Is that because it's a it's almost a respite from the sport and life or? Yeah, it's kind of. Well, there's a couple of reasons. One, definitely that it's a little bit of normality in between all the sort of other crazy stuff that's been going on. But also, I'm intending to come back to the band. The elite athlete's only ever going to be a temporary situation. Uh, and I still, I don't quite feel like I've, I've done the job properly yet, just with everything that's happened between all rehab and things. So it's good to, to be here to keep the connections with the band. I'm really fortunate that I've got the opportunities over the summer when our training schedule is a little bit quieter that I can still come in and help out here. Well, look, you're in your amazing GB kit. So mm. how were you received when, when you came back from, from competing? Were, were, did, they, oh. did they put the red carpet out for you? I mean, did they no, hold you? No, mainly oh, because show I didn't want oh. that. Like, I'll just try and sneak in the back door and oh. nobody will notice I've been gone. Um, it didn't quite work like that. But yeah, everybody's been really supportive here. Can I just go back to when you learned to ski? Because people in your position, you could still, I mean, some people ski with a prosthetic leg. Some people, I mean, Andy Barlow, for example, I don't yeah. remember, obviously just skis with the yeah. one leg. Um, you ha have ended up in a sit ski. How, was, how did that sort of decision come around as well? At the time, it wasn't really a decision. I learned to ski before I had my amputation while my leg was still injured. So because my leg was basically useless. Mm -hmm. I couldn't, there wasn't any option for me to stand up ski. Right. Um, if I was learning to ski from scratch now, I probably would, well, I almost definitely would learn to ski with my prosthetic. Um, and that is actually, it's a future goal. I'd like to be able to do it. I'll still race in my sit ski because I've had a bit of a head start on that. Yeah. But I would like to learn to, to stand up ski with my prosthetic. And but when, it, oh, sorry. No, I, I just want to yeah. just with the sit ski, because it's a whole different mm. concept and it's, it almost, and I've skied my entire life on two legs, and the, the idea of being in a sit ski and being that close to the ground and when you do, you know, fall, I just feel like you, the, you can't get out of it. It's sort of, you know, what's the experience like in it when you're learning it? Well, it's a little bit hard for me to comment because I've never done stand-up skiing, mm -hmm. so I can't really compare. But I suppose in a way, because you're sort of enclosed, it almost protects you a little bit if you fall. You're closer to the ground, so you've not got... Far to fall, although because you are, your centre of gravity is closer to the ground, you can pick up quite a bit more speed. Just it sometimes looks like you're in a capsule yeah. and you're going to be like rolling on forever. But. Well, just an extension of your mm. question, because music and, and rhythm is a big part of your life, how much of the rhythm of you as, as, a, as a human body <laughs> going down the street, are you looking for a, for a rhythm when you're when Yeah, you're rhythm actually helps quite a lot. When we're going down the race courses and you've got the pattern of gates and you can see then where there's a a sort of 
constant rhythm and then the rhythm will change a little bit and then it'll go back to a steady. So actually having that rhythm probably does help a little bit. And is a very there, good question. Thank you very much. And is there a tune that you play in your head when you're going down? <laughs> no, I'm usually no. too busy trying to go the right way <laughs> yeah, around the gate. Yeah, through the right gate. See, I had images of Ride of the Valkyries or something yeah, like that. Yeah, something, yeah, I was thinking that as well. Yeah. I can't think of what at the moment, but something fast-paced and sort of exciting. Um, what was your Paralympics experience like? Um, go from like being picked, you know, getting the realisation that you'd be going to Beijing and stuff like that. Of course, and it came at the height of, of COVID as of well. Of course, yeah. And also the teammates that you were with and had got to know. And I know that there's quite a strong military connection between the winter skiing and the Armed yeah. Forces Paris snow sport team and stuff. My Paralympic experience, I don't think I can describe it in any other way than just it's been a complete whirlwind. Because I came to skiing fairly late and then, as you mentioned, COVID disrupted things for a good couple of years. And it just looked like I wasn't even going to be able to qualify, partly because I wasn't quite good enough yet. And just I didn't have the time to put in the training and we were on a really short time frame. So everything ended up happening really quickly, just sort of over the last 12 months. It was only pretty much this time last year that I actually even qualified for the GB team, never mind qualifying for the Paralympic Games so then I was selected for the GB team at the end of the summer for the start of this season uh, I did my first World Cup races in December went to my first World Championships in January and then was selected for the Paralympics in February so it was just sort of non-stop but you were doing quite well in in the run up to Paralympics you were getting you know medals silvers I seem to remember seemed to be a, a bit of a, a constant but um is the Paralympics a whole different kettle of fish in that sense yeah yeah, it was just another complete step up from anything I'd done before in terms both of the skiing sort of difficulty of the courses and what we were expected to do, but also everything else that comes along with the Paralympics, the sort of media, all the publicity that until then, you know, I've been a little anonymous skier. <laughs> we do races and nobody really knows that there's races going on and then all of a sudden the Paralympics is everywhere in the media. Yeah. I, I get the impression that you, you quite like to hide behind the <laughs> anonymity. You, you want to come in and, and just be part of the band. When I'm sitting in the band, I can hide at the back. I just play my French horn. And but you've made some and... steely determined decisions in your life to have your leg amputated, to have the confidence to compete on the world stage in the Paralympics and to play the French horn, a, a, an <laughs> instrument that I imagine likes to be heard. So behind that shy and retiring Shona, there is some steel and determination. Mm. There is determination, yeah. Where does that come from? Scottish. Scottish. Ah. Possibly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure, it's just, it's just always been there. Yeah, I mean, yeah. In inherent, I, yeah, it's just there. Something I want to do, I'll... And do you surprise your, your friends and your relatives with, with what you've accomplished and what you continue yeah. to accomplish? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah they, you do surprise them. <laughs> yeah, um, my parents, I think, well, they just despair sometimes. I'm sure it's just off doing something else crazy now. So. <laughs> And yeah. home is obviously Scotland. Um, you, you are, away from being an elite athlete, you are based here at RAF Northall. Um, but home is Scotland. Um, wearing a GB shirt, do you feel, I always ask this because, do you feel that the, you know, your Scottishness is sort of represented, you're very proud Scotswoman, you know, but being in that, in that GB vest? Yeah, I think, I think they both go together. I mean, obviously I'm proud to be Scottish, but... I'm also very proud to be wearing the GB colours and to go out there and represent GB at the Paralympics. You're on the start line at the Paralympics or you're in a, a huge concert. What are the feelings and emotions going through you? Because I suppose one, it's very much you on your own. The other, well, if, if, if you mess up, you can blame it on the guy playing the bassoon. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Neil. <laughs> that doesn't always work, unfortunately. But actually, the feelings are very similar. Um, it's... They're both performance aspects in different ways, but the sort of performance pressure and nerves you get are very similar. So I would say that sitting on the start line at the Paralympics or a big competition is very similar to the nerves or the, the feelings you get before a big performance. And of course, with a performance, you're there to entertain, whereas with skiing, it's very much get the job done. But oh. do you try and put a little bit of flair in your skiing as well? <laughs> I Again, no, I'm no. too busy trying to go the <laughs> right way around the, the gates. But again, it yeah. probably is entertaining on the occasions when things don't go quite right and you end up having a few somersaults. Have you had a few wipeouts over the years? Uh, yeah. Talk us through a tumble. Uh, it's just part and parcel of the sport, really. And just you get to the stage where you know you're going over. You think, yep, there's no coming <laughs> back from this. And at that point, I suppose you just go into preservation mode and think, how's this going to hurt the least? <laughs> 
the breathing and the core strength that you have for your skiing, does that help with your music and vice versa? Uh, I think the breathing that I've had through music definitely helps in the skiing. Again, particularly in the sort of pre-race calming the nerves thing, yeah. can do a lot of the, the same breathing exercises that I would do in music. And again, is there a piece of music that you would listen to to calm yourself pre-race or psych yourself uh, up? Not, not really to calm myself down. That's more just the sort of breathing and quietness. Uh, it's become a bit of a joke within our team that um, my theme tune is sort of the Top Gun theme tune ah. now. Um, <laughs> you feel the need for speed? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Partly because of the quote and partly because one of my coaches thought it was quite funny just with the Air Force connection and then it's, it's just stuck. So, well, there, there is a, there is a hint of maverick about you, yeah, that steely <laughs> determination, steely maverick, the yeah. quiet maverick, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Gonna see. Do you see another Paralympics in your future? Is that the aim at the moment to to keep skiing for GB and, and see what you can achieve in the next few years? I haven't ruled it out. Um, there's a lot of variables. Obviously, it depends what happens with with the work. Um, I'm very fortunate that I've had the support of the RAF, um, and hopefully that will continue. Um, I'll also have to meet performance targets. You know, my space on the GB team isn't assured. I have to keep performing and keep achieving those targets to be reselected. Um, but I would like to see what happens over the next four years. So, in terms of your calendar year, I'm thinking that music-wise, you know, now summer is, is the big time, especially with a with a jubilee on or something like that. And then, does it taper off towards the winter months, allowing you to ski? Not. Oh. Not really, <laughs> because uh. Christmas is also quite a big. Yeah. A busy time for the bands. Um, actually, we don't have too many quiet times in the bands. There's always some big events going on throughout the year. Uh, again, I'm very fortunate that I've had a lot of support from RAF Music Services. So even before I was on the Elite Athlete Scheme, while I was full time in the band, they would be really understanding. Uh, they hopefully realised that I wasn't just going off on skiing holidays, <laughs> that I was actually working and it was um, fairly intensive training camps. But they would always try and release me from engagements if they could. And um, we talked earlier about the, uh, the support you've had from the service um, during your time of injury and stuff like that. Do you, th there are obviously, we, we know a lot of athletes who, or who become athletes who had to leave their service because their job couldn't, couldn't be done um, with a physical injury. Yeah. How much has the RAF been integral in making sure that you could maintain your job and your position within the RAF? get on the athlete scheme, also be a professional athlete at the same time, how much have they um, you know, made sure? Because I think maybe 10, 15 years ago with your injury, you would have had to have left, but po possibly now we're in a time where they're trying to make it work for you rather than you know, just say, well, sorry, you're injured, you've got to go. Yeah. I do think a few years ago, sort of amputation, they'd mm. have taken one look at you and thought, no, you can't possibly be in the military. Uh, I think... There's a combination of things that have happened. Um, prosthetics have advanced considerably even over the last few years because there's been a need for it because more people, unfortunately, have been getting injured, especially through the military. Um, and it's been young, active people who want to mm. keep doing things. So prosthetics have advanced and are now a lot more functional than they were a few years ago. Uh, I can't say it's always been a smooth ride, but I've had an awful lot of support I mean, music services technically shouldn't really have kept me on because on paper, when I was on crutches, I was broken, I wasn't able to march. Uh, I had a huge amount of support allowing me to do all the sit-down concerts. Um, and then because I play a bit of piano as well, I could work with the salon orchestra and did piano for a lot of their jobs. So I was still working full-time hours as a full-time musician, even though I was injured. Um, I think at the time, nobody expected it to go on quite as long as it did. So your versatility but as a musician has, has, has kept you in the RAF it's, almost? That, it's helped. And then again, I think since the amputation, I was determined that if, if I was going to stay in, I wasn't going to ask for exceptions. So if I was staying in, it had to be the same standards as everybody else. So I've passed my fitness test and things like that. So I'm doing the same as anybody else whether they've got four functional limbs or I'm meeting the same standards. So I think that helps because I'm not asking the RAF to make any special exception for me. Well, it's not just the versatility that we've spoken about in your music background. I understand that you've dabbled in other sports as well. A little <laughs> bit of triathlon, is that right? I, yeah, I took up yeah. triathlon. It was, <laughs> as you do. Yeah, 
it was a bit of a rehab goal after amputation actually I've always enjoyed swimming and cycling and running something that I had to do when I, to join the RAF um, and I entered a charity triathlon to raise money for the Armed Forces Paris No Sport team who have also given me a lot of support over the past few years um, and then I just ended up enjoying it and <laughs> I've done a few more since then. Do you see yourself going further with it? Um, not at the moment because I don't have time in between trying to do things with the band and hopefully keeping up my ski training. It's a really good way of keeping my training up during the summer. Just a little bit of cross training it gets me out of the gym just doing some running, swimming, cycling. Um, helps keep me fit over the summer and it's a good, good bit of fun but at the moment it's just a bit of fun. And do you find yourself uh, sort of working in the same circles as some of your other military people? Because I know a lot of uh, military para-athletes also dabble in, in triathlon. There yes. is an appeal, I think, of that sport for military types. So one of the other RAF elite athletes, Luke Pollard, is actually a guide for a visually mm -hmm. impaired oh, triathlete who, yeah. Yeah, who was in Tokyo. Um, so I don't usually see an awful lot of him as he's usually zooming past me on the bike. <laughs> uh, but we've also got quite a large military representation in the Paris No Sports mm. team. Uh, we have... I think there were three of us from the Armed Forces Paris No Sports team went to Beijing uh, and there's also two military who are guides for the visually impaired skiers. Yes, yeah, so you had um, Dan Sheen yeah. and Dan Sheen Alex, and Alex as well in the sit skis yeah. and then obviously the guys, you know, Gary and, and Gary Brett. And Brett and yeah. yeah, I mean, that's what I meant, you know, it's like going one, home from, from home. one family to yeah. another yeah. family. Did that help when you were out there, people that you could mm. converse with? I think it does. I mean, Dan yeah. and Alex, well, Dan and Alex started a couple of years before I did, so they've sort of always been a part of my journey. Um, so we've, yeah, it's just been like a little family. It was really nice having them there at the Paralympics because we know each other. We know, we know how each works. We're there to support each other and sort of help, help each other along. <laughs> Do you, is there a race that you've particularly enjoyed? Was there a favourite race that stands out for you? Uh, You can I say think, no, I love them all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do. I mean, each each race is different because the hills are different. Every course is set differently. I suppose the big one was probably um, at the US Paralympic National Championships last year, which is when I met the qualification criteria for the Paralympics. So that's probably the standout race at the moment. And I was going to follow that up with, is there a piece of music that you love performing because of the reaction that you see with those watching and listening or, or just the feeling that it gives you um not the top gun theme <laughs> wow. no i think there are too many pieces of music to choose from i mean a lot of when we're out performing with the raf bands a lot of the military ones are really well received things like dam busters and 633 squadron they they always go down really well and is there an event with the band that you look forward to? Is there an annual, annual event that you think, I've got to clear the diary, I want to be part, you know, I'm going to be part of that? I think one of the biggest jobs I've done with the band was uh, doing the parade at the Cenotaph on Remembrance Sunday. And that was something, again, for years I wasn't able to march. And the year after my amputation, that was one of my goals, I want to do this, because it's such a big event and such a memorable event. Um, and that was just, that was quite a big achievement that, I've got here, I've done it, and been part of such a big occasion. Uh, we also do public duties, changing of the guard at Buckingham Palace quite often. Um, I'm hoping to get in on some of them this summer, so <laughs> that'll be quite good fun. Do you ever pinch yourself and think what you've achieved, what mm. you've accomplished? All the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, look, Shona, I think you're a superstar. Mm. I think you're a reluctant superstar. <laughs> yeah. But I'm afraid that's, that's the position you find yourself in. I'm... I'm glad I chased you for months um, to get you on and we wish you all the best in band life, in sporting life and um, we'll be following you closely, I'm afraid, and you'll probably hear from us again. But thank you so much for joining us on Forces. Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to bring some fruit to put on your porridge because the only <laughs> you only put salt on it is really... It's, I don't want to say it's disturbed me, but I think you can spice it up a bit. Zhuzh. Is that a Scottish thing? Salt. Oh, salt that, that's, that's, what my, yeah, that's, that's what your mum and dad did. My mum and dad did it, my grandparents Maybe did it. Maybe that's your so. secret to your success, the salt, like on salt the and porridge. porridge. It's a bit late for me, isn't it, to start putting yeah. salt on my porridge. Yeah. But brilliant. Thank you so much, <laughs> and um, we'll, we'll see you soon, no doubt, I'm sure. Thank, Thank you. you very much.